Hello, everybody. It is Carly Benhart Kukula again, uh, just checking in while we have a moment to say that our first transportation club meeting of uh, the CMU Transportation Club, which is a university wide transportation club for all those who are interested, regardless of their majors or other backgrounds, Transportation Club gives opportunities to interested students to tour facilities. Uh, we were about to, right before COVID, tour the Cranberry Traffic Transportation Center um, to get involved with transportation-related internships and to participate in a community of like-minded individuals. So if that sounds interesting to you, please do come to our first meeting. It is next Monday, from 12 to 1 p.m., which is over the lunch break if you are a participant in the Heinz College. And come and learn about the direction we're trying to take the club in this year. Help us pick meeting times. And we hope to see you there. If you're interested, please put yourself uh, through sending us your email on the transportation list, and we will be able to send you information for that meeting. We are going to follow up the day of with uh, the Zoom information. All right, thank you guys. Rahul has now jumped back on. So I am going to reintroduce him again. Rahul designs safe autonomous systems and works at the intersection of formal methods, control systems, and machine learning. He is a Carnegie Mellon University alumni as well as having received the U.S. Presidential Early Career Award, the DOE's Clean Tech Prize, the IEEE Benjamin Franklin Key Award, and Intel Early Faculty Career Award. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. So I'd like to talk to you about some of the very exciting work we've been doing in developing communities around autonomous vehicles and uh, you know what's more exciting in autonomous vehicles and autonomous racing right so so living at the limits uh, and so as part of this effort what we have done over the past couple of years is we've developed these platforms uh, that are very high speed that can drive at the uh, at up to 50 miles per hour they are one tenth the scale of formula racing cars uh, but they are 10 times the fun because you can actually you know, make them fully self-driving and you can see that very quickly. They have LIDARs, cameras, graphics processing, compute units on board. They're not too complex, but they're complex enough to have the scaling and the similitude of sensing, uh, of perception, planning and control from one tenth scale to the full scale. They're very good for rapid prototyping and for uh, training future engineers in all the complexities that come about in developing autonomous vehicles. And so we go from designing like the, the mechanics aspects to uh, putting together all the sensors, developing the whole autonomous vehicle uh, software stack for perception, planning and control, um, and, uh, and then facilitating a lot of research. Uh, and over the globe, uh, we have over 60 universities that are part of this community and over a dozen of them are teaching the courses we have. And uh, so on one side, you can think of this as, okay, this is an educational effort, but uh, we also have a lot of industry involved with the AutoWare Foundation. We have the DOT uh, Karma, uh, which is on uh, connected autonomous vehicles are, part are partnered here. And also uh, the Apache Foundation is out uh, and, and the, uh, is, is part of uh, the Eclipse Foundation uh, is part of uh, F110 partnerships. So the reason we focus on racing is that for over a decade, we work on you know autonomous vehicle safety. And the issue with that is if we just look at civilian driving, if you focus on one aspect, say like just driving through intersections, then, then you get asked, okay, well, what about mergers? What about nighttime? What about rainy uh, days? What about... Uh, issues in decision making, uh, what about issues in control? And so there are the, the civilian driving case is, is very broad. And as a research program, while we are really attacking different aspects over there, we really wanted to sort of look at 
specific aspects where in racing you have a limited scope that means you have a known track and you got to win the race by being you know as fast as possible or overtaking all your opponents and so here you know unlike civilian driving where you're not you're not sure about whether the drivers are cooperative or aggressive and you know when i moved from pittsburgh to philadelphia there was a lot more aggressive drivers in downtown philadelphia than in pittsburgh and we we also have few uh, implants with the pittsburgh left over here but not as much right so uh, but in racing on the other hand you have you know every driver by definition is on the extreme end of this spectrum of being an adversarial driver so you're really uh, you know operating at the limits of you know perception planning and control and that's when you you are stress testing all the algorithms that you develop and so our goal was to sort of take you know see how we can build these communities to help uh, you know students and uh, lifelong engineers to build code and race these vehicles and you'll gradually see why we are focused on doing that and and where this is sort of taking you know the community as a whole uh, not just in kind of a work workplace uh, you know training for the next generation of the engineers that we require but also in terms of you know uh, how we address you know many decision making problems and also how we rapidly prototype and develop safer systems so our goal was really very simple how can we get you know make autonomous vehicles you know available accessible and reasonably affordable to you know any kind of person that wants to do it but in a in a very systematic and programmatic way right so so how do you go from a bunch of parts and put together this car it just takes one hour okay now the car is done we don't have to think of f110 as just this toyish kind of car uh, because it is quite a beast but the point over here is that now you know the platform the hardware is done so no more fear for people who are you know have an allergy to working with physical systems and so we put together all of the bill of materials it's easy to get through this it costs between 2 to 3000 dollars and why you might say oh that's really really expensive from an institutional perspective it is very affordable for the performance that you get yeah you can get a 200 dollar system or a 400 dollar system but you're not going to be able to have that similitude with the full scale vehicle so we have to really operate at a certain level and uh, but i will not make this a contentious point over here because this has not been a barrier for you know more than you know 60 plus institutions to work on this uh, platform the the key point is you know what is the what is the benefit of the training what is the ease of use of this platform can it do all of the things that we wanted to do really well is the code clean is the system clean is the community running all of that to me that is also what is not you know given a dollar price as a cost so the physical platform might cost something but then you're ready to code you can get the system up and running uh, you know within within 2 hours uh, after you build it up and so and what we are really focused on here is how do you go from simple algorithms for obstacle avoidance to full blown advanced algorithms that do simultaneous localization and mapping which are used in you know uh, actual rollouts of autonomous vehicles on the street and so we are using very very similar kind of you know uh, technology and uh, software algorithms to do that over here and they work you know flawlessly on this platform how do you go from you know planning to drive a car by following the wall or or doing some kind of line following really you know basic algorithms that you would learn in high school to very advanced you know uh, robot planning and motion planning algorithms like rapidly exploring random trees which are the basis for a lot of the planning algorithms on how a vehicle drives through the streets how do you go from simple you know uh, pid control which is you know the most basic you know uh, model free control to a uh, more optimal and robust and safer model predictive control and so that you are planning you know to drive and following trajectories in in a very robust manner over here so and, and that's what we enable you know with with all of the work that we are doing here is that you know how do we get to very high performance systems right you can get to like some kind of toy system that you see in a class as a little course that is taught here or there that is kind of like a mock example of something in the real world but we want to be bridging to the full scale vehicles 
by allowing for design and simulation, then taking that same design and moving that design into one ten scale platforms and taking the same code and running that in a scaled up version of that in the auto wear enabled vehicles like that, right? So uh, that is a good, you know, set of partners that are part of, you know, F110. And even these are not just, you know, uh, logos of partners. Each of the partners has a research program and a use specific use for, you know, how they are using and how they plan to use F110. And most of them are engaged in our program actively. Uh, uh, most of them have, you know, at least one or more F110 vehicles that they're actively using uh, within their, uh, their research program. Um, so the reason we started this was that, you know, my research is at this, you know, very narrow in intersection of formal methods is how do we, you know, make sure that the software within these life critical or safety critical systems is, can be proved to be safe and control systems, as you know, you know, we have uh, system dynamics over here and also uh, machine learning, you know, algorithms where we have a lot of machine learning as part of the tools that we design and as part of the, the perception planning control pipeline that we have. But in order to design an autonomous vehicle, you have to have sensing and perception, you have to have motion planning, you have to have, know how to implement these in actual hardware and software, and then you need to know mechatronics and power systems. Now, when students or anybody is educated, all of, you know, most of the engineering education is very siloed and say, okay, you only learn computer vision, you don't have to worry about, you know, the rest of the world. You only learn about controls, you don't have to worry about the rest of the world. And so here we are really looking at this as how do you actually, you know, work on a realistic system with all its complexities and in order to solve a problem, you have to use a little bit of power systems, a little bit of mechatronics, and a little bit maybe of perception to solve that problem. So how do you start to think as a systems engineer, but in the autonomous vehicle systems context, not a classic system engineer only? So as part of this, we have a very good team from several universities uh, who are, you know, and, and even we have partners in Europe over here, our partners in Europe, in fact, they have a Maserati as their autonomous vehicle, but they are very proud of their, you know, one ten scale autonomous vehicle that they use. Uh, this is also now the basis of a lot of the work that is done in the Indy Autonomous Racing Challenge competition that uh, this team is part of and many of the teams are. The students that have graduated from this program have gone on to become, you know, the uh, leading, you know, uh, planning, uh, robot planning engineers in Tesla, autonomous uh, vehicles uh, in NVIDIA, uh, Honda autonomous vehicles, Amazon robotics, we have a YouTube star. Actually, Carter Scherer, interestingly, is a, is a, stu is a CMU grad who came to my lab to work for a year. And now he has, I think, over 6 million followers in his YouTube channel. I, I won't credit F110 as being, you know, part of his success there, but he was a fantastic engineer while he was part of our group. And then all the other folks have gone on to, you know, either go to very interesting companies like Zooks and Rivian and Drone Racing League. And many have gone on to be professors. Uh, in fact, last week, one just joined University of Waterloo from the uh, graduates, right? And our goal is really to be very inviting, very open uh, for any, person to be part of, you know, this F110 effort. And we do this by having competitions uh, where we have several international competitions over the last couple of years. And uh, starting with the 2016 in Pittsburgh, uh, and actually we were racing, the first competition was in, in the Wien Hall seventh floor. And it brought me back to both the memories and nightmares of being a CMU student. And, and then it allowed us to go all over the world during COVID times, you know, we have actually moved on to uh, virtual autonomous racing. And that has actually been very effective in the race that we recently had in October, 2020, there were over 63 participants and they were fully engaged from different parts of the world. And when we sort of start to look at what do we look for in this virtual autonomous racing, the first benchmark is for a single vehicle with a known map, how do you actually find the fastest path and actually execute the fastest path? So how do you find the racing line? So there's a lot of 
you know, optimization and control that is part of this, but the system has to work for real, both in simulation and the real vehicle. The next one is really, as you have obstacles, both static and dynamic obstacles, how do you actually come up with strategies to do that, right? Here, this vehicle is switching between, you know, six pre-planned strategies, and that's one efficient way of doing it, but uh, different people have different solutions. Uh, and then obviously to get to, you know, multi-vehicle racing. And, uh, you know, in the coming year, we will have very fantastic uh, graphics uh, as we have uh, uh, LG uh, Silicon Valley has uh, actually in implemented one ten scale autonomous racing in their fantastic simulation tool. And uh, so we will go from, you know, kind of 2D to 3D uh, uh, racing. Uh, and then this is an example of how the racing goes. You can see uh, this, uh, uh, the cars are going at a very high speed. The video slowed down over here a little. And uh, so, so in order to support a lot of this, uh, we actually have developed a suite of uh, simulators where you have a software in the loop simulation that captures all the vehicle dynamics and you can drive with the LIDAR uh, sensor and do uh, you know, pretty much all the labs and all the um, uh, different uh, lectures that we have developed. And then we have for research, you know, we have simulators that work with open AI gym. So you can use reinforcement learning, you can run very large scale experiments on, on Amazon uh, uh, web services uh, and, and that's supported a lot of research. And then we also have photorealistic, you know, uh, simulators where this is actually the real corridor on the bottom uh, right side over here. And, uh, and then this is the, the virtual one and you can train within that virtual space over there, right? So, uh, uh, so whenever we have these races, we have a schedule and then participants are onboarded and you know, it's, there's a mix of training the participants and, and then really guiding them to actually win in the race. And, uh, but to do that, we also have developed a, a, a very good course uh, plan and a curriculum uh, to be able to do uh, so to get from the basics of you know learning about the robot operating system putting the system together and and then I'll walk you through what we cover in this and if you have any questions you know please feel free to uh, you know interrupt I, I have way too many slides to cover so you know uh, joy please let me know when to stop talking also but I'll um, you know I'll be happy to answer any questions the whole point is that we want to you know expand this to and open it to the broader, you know, transportation communities that we have. So the nice part about this course that we started was that, and is that it's not, there are no midterms, but after six weeks, you have a, a race and it's, it's competitive. After 10 weeks, you have the next race where now you're building maps and you're using much more control, uh, new control me mechanisms. And then at the end of the semester, you have you know, uh, the full heavy duty kind of race where you're really using a lot of strategy also, right? So uh, the reason for having this competitive aspect is that it resonates well with, you know, the current generation of the students, but also makes it a lot of fun. And so we start with AV driving basics. Those are my kids screaming in the background because the Philadelphia public schools are half day uh, this this week. So they, are, they wanted them to go and enjoy their lives. So. Uh, so we, we start with, you know, automatic emergency braking is like how you have in order to work with autonomous cars, you have to know how to build a safe car to begin with. So how do you prevent it from crashing? How do you understand what is time to collision? And then how do you understand what are false positive problems, false negative problems? And how do you deal with that, you know, early on? Then uh, we do a lot of the development within the F110 simulator. And, and this is a very lightweight simulator. It was very capable to doing perception planning control. And, uh, and it's also very easy to use to get started with that. And it has a lot of algorithms that are built in uh, and that you can also get started with uh, and has the full vehicle dynamics that are very similar and tuned to the actual vehicle. So whatever you develop in the simulator can directly run on the vehicle with just a little bit of tweaking at the corners and, and you know, as the vehicle is skidding uh, or, or drifting like that, right? So, but 
most students spend about 80% of their time actually in simulator land. And then it's very easy to prototype and, and run the code rather than keep fixing the code in the physical vehicle. And we made it very easy to understand how to use the simulator as you go. The simulator also runs within you know, the, a web browser as a Docker instance. So it's, it's, there's no hassle in terms of you know, it's, uh, installing it. And the ease of use for us is, is really important over there. Right? So, uh, then we talk about the basics of, from the mechanical engineering perspective of you know rigid body transforms, pose transformations that you know you have different sensors, you have a world map, and how do you actually view everything within the same reference space like that, right? So you have, and this is the same issue that you have in in real vehicles that like you have multiple lidars and cameras. They are all looking at the world, but you want to have you know a homogeneous or or a harmonized worldview. And so how do you do the math for that and how do you incorporate that? And so if you have a first person view, like in the in this figure on the left side over here, uh, how do you incorporate that into a worldview or a bird's eye view to know where you are in a global frame, right? So from a local frame uh, with your laser finder, your, your LIDAR, how do you capture that in a global frame? Then you get started with saying, okay, now we built a car and now let's get moving with the real car. You test the motors, you have the drive system and uh, essentially the speed control. And then now it's ready to roll. And so as part of that, we start with reactive system that's saying that you don't have a map. You just have the LIDAR. You just know what you see right now. How can you drive, right? So you can follow the wall and you can do some conservative driving like that. And so this is from one of the races that we had in Seoul uh, in Korea. And, uh, and uh, so now if you just are seeing the world as it is without you know, having a, a, a global map, what's the best you can do? How do you get the car to move there? So how do you tune the car? So this is basic PID control tuning for the steering and for the accelerator. And, and this so sort of the students get to work hands-on with this effort over here. And then you say, okay, well, how do we avoid obstacles if I just see them in front of me? And how do I react very quickly to that, right? So you want to be able to do that very, very effectively also. Then you say, okay, now we want to be able to run, you know, our first race. We can put a lot of obstacles in our simulator, see that it navigates this course really well. And we just say, look, if it doesn't work in the simulator, forget about it. If it works in the simulator, let's go to the next stage. And we walk through different algorithms and heuristics of how do you do obstacle avoidance in a very smooth and agile manner as obstacles are just thrown at you to get started that. And that's like lab three. And then by lab four, you know, um, by, then you are ready to race. And this is the six week point and your, your, your car can go full speed up after this point over here. And then we start introducing how to do, you know, mapping, localization, and then planning when you're given a map. So a central part of the simultaneous localization and mapping is to do scan matching. That if I've moved ahead, you know, a little bit, how do I know how much I moved ahead with reference to my previous position and how do I update my position within that? So uh, we introduce, uh, you know, uh, 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 algorithms like interior, uh, closest point uh, ma matching and how to do that efficiently because you're running, you have to run this at a very high uh, uh, frequency. So the students read a paper that actually captures this, uh, you know, iterative closest point uh, um, matching. And then they actually have to understand the math and actually implement that in their code as part of uh, lab five over here. And then, then they go ahead and implement that. Uh, they, they run, you know, a SLAM program like Google Cartographer uh, with the actual vehicle in the, in the corridors and they understand how that actually works and they understand how to build these maps as they are uh, uh, starting to uh, prepare for the next race. And then once you have a map, you need to localize yourself. You need to say, where am I in this worldview? And you use an approach called the particle filter to make multiple guesses and to pick the best guess for where you are. And this is all kind of standard practice now for anybody working in autonomous vehicles, but you have to learn it and you can't just learn it theoretically and in simulation. You have to learn it by also doing it. So we want to cover the theory, the simulation, and the, the reality. Right? And now once you know where you are in the world and you have a map, how do you plan out? The simplest way is, to, is a pure pursuit planner. Just says, I have a set of waypoints. 
how do I find a set of splines that will allow me to smoothly navigate through that world? And so they have to implement that as part of lab six. And then you can see now the car goes much faster once you have a map over here. Right? And, and so this is a uh, car is going at at least, you know, uh, uh, seven to eight miles per hour. So that, that this is our former teaching assistant uh, and he's getting a good workout at two in the morning. And so this is also a good way to keep our, you know, uh, engineering students fit, right? So that, that's just my sadistic way, but don't worry, he's, he's earning a lot of money in, in NVIDIA now as an autonomous and firmware engineer. So, uh, and so then they learn the, the, the math of, you know, how do you actually come up with a basic, you know, a planning algorithm and, and how do you execute that for real, right? And, and then that's now they're ready for the next race where they have a map and then they can race in a much more faster, more agile manner. And then we get to motion planning, where we introduce the students to different planning. But before that, we take a short break and we talk about ethics and moral decision making, you know, with uh, autonomous vehicles. And, you know, when this Uber accident happened, for example, and we look at a lot of ethical, uh, you know, papers and have these arguments as to, well, who, whose fault is it? Who is, who, you know, what is the blame assignment? Is it the the driver who's not really driving? Is it the regulators? It is, is it the programmer? Is it the company? Today, everybody points their fingers at somebody else. And so you want to sort of have engineers at least build a framework on how to reason about ethics as they're designing these decision-making algorithms and these behavioral planners on what to do under different situations, right? So uh, then we talk about motion planning in, in more broader terms, in terms of implementing you know, more robust and, and agile planners such as RRT and, uh, and the students actually have to implement that in both in simulation and actually in the vehicle. And here is an example of how a vehicle is doing an overtake and it has to balance, you know, not crashing into the other vehicle and also maximizing its speed so it can actually execute the overtake uh, smoothly like that, right? So, uh, so how do you come up with that? How do you generate these splines and decide which, one, which path to actually pick? Then as you're preparing for the next race, you have to say, okay, well, given a racetrack, how do I figure out what is the optimal racing line so I can actually zip through the track as fast as possible? And, and how do I maximize my speed at any point over there, right? So how do you find this best strategy and how do you iterate through, you know, uh, candidate strategies and come up with the optimized strategy and then get it to work for real, right? So this is finding the best strategy and now executing the best strategy. And then we have, you know, a whole module on vision and learning. So more on the perception side, we start with, you know, really classic computer vision, homography, geometric approaches for computer vision. But then we also look at April tags and detecting, right? So can we rapidly detect the other vehicle? Because now we want to start to do, you know, more overtaking strategies as we go, go through that, right? So, uh, uh, and, and so then, uh, <clears throat> As we go through this, then we want to sort of use like reinforcement learning approaches where, you know, this is called uh, imitation learning. And it is really like, you know, you are teaching the, like a baby to follow a certain set of, you know, behaviors, and then it starts to follow those behaviors. Here we basically teach the vehicle to drive with a LIDAR and camera, but then we take out the, the LIDAR and it only drives with the camera because then it has been trained, you know, to know what are obstacles and how to go through. And then there's another approach called like with the, within reinforcement learning called, uh, you know, behavioral cloning. That means you drive the vehicle uh, for, you know, five minutes around the block. And then the, the, the system learns to drive as well or as poorly as you drive. And here you can see that, you know, it's, trying, it's, it's, it's picking up how the driver drives along, you know, different uh, corners and streets. And then it can start to drive in any place, just like you would drive. And it's actually very, very effective and it learns very quickly. And then they are ready for the final race, you know, and we have a lot of invited lectures, students work in groups, uh, but they, they learn, you know, from the hardware, software, all of that together, like that, right? Because they are also learning how to build and operate a system as a whole. And then they pick final projects to work on and these could be like, you know, in terms of building a photorealistic simulator, in terms of overtaking strategies and, 
uh, or uh, implementing like you know model predictive control for very agile control of the vehicle as it's driving through you know cluttered spaces at high speed and then they are ready for the final race and this is head to head racing with multiple vehicles so you can see one vehicle is in front of this vehicle and it's really trying to uh, aggressively overtake that vehicle and almost like uh, hits the other vehicle as it's trying to do an overtake and uh, so this is really where you see you know and then you know we so there it just bumped into the other vehicle we see how to um, get into you know uh, where we give an advantage to a certain vehicle and and then we 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 flip it around and that's how we can evaluate who's who's uh, car is a better racer and uh, and then we get into like you know different racing approaches uh, and we have many races in the physical world but here you know these are kind of research backed approaches and over the past year this is just a selection of you know from many of the papers that we've had you know both as a community uh, within the machine learning communities within the robotics communities with new rips and uh, the proceedings of machine learning Um, our F110 also won a second best paper award for cu new curriculum development for teaching autonomous systems. I'll very briefly go through two of these ideas, and then I'll, I'll I'll come to an end over here. So one problem over here, is which we call Formula Zero, is really on how do you balance, you know, the safety and performance, right? So suppose I'm driving from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, and I reach five minutes late. Raj will be like, okay, no big deal. At least you're alive, right? I mean. Uh, Okay, he wants at least you're alive. We we kind of take that implicitly, right? But in a if you're racing a race and you're even half a second too slow, that's a career decision. You're not going to win the race, and you're not going to win any race if you're just too conservative. So how do you balance that without crashing? How do you maximize your you know overtake success rate, your speed, and the Can interesting? You know? Yes, I'm sorry, we have a question. Oh yeah, go ahead, somebody. Uh Yeah. Helen at said we all know competition is a phenomenal motivator. Congratulations on building teams who push research and autonomy. One question about the use of lidar. Some manufacturers prefer cameras to lidars. Can you comment on this and is this reflected in the F110 competitors hardware choice? Yes, yeah, so so here we give the competitors uh, you know a, uh, an open choice to use uh, uh, lidars. or cameras or lidars and cameras right they are they are complementary technologies they cannot just be used on their own uh, there are certain cases where uh, cameras are better than lidars and certain cases like in terms of object detection and uh, certain cases in terms of operating under you know uh, low light conditions where lidars are better than cameras and this is a it's a well known debate and you know while you know certain popular people like elon musk say oh we don't need lidars in our tesla uh, i would say that you know teslas are not you know they they are they are still incredibly risky vehicles to put at the level that we are you know in terms of the technology development where we are right so so i think uh, from uh, from our perspective which is not getting into elon musk and tesla really i mean that that's bigger than us uh is really that you know we 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 use them as complementary approaches like that right so we we teach the computer vision aspects with with monocular and stereo cameras and then we teach the perception pipeline also with you know uh, point clouds and depth maps from the lidar and then you have to do the sensor fusion to basically get the best of you know all these types of sensors so that's that's a very good question and that's uh, you know exactly why we want the students to know this you know both theoretically and in a hands-on manner so <clears throat> also so, are you are you sending any of the data to the cloud we are not sending any of this data to the cloud as of now but in the a new generation project that we have currently under development uh, we have uh, fleets of autonomous vehicles racing together i mean that that we control together for aggressive maneuvers and for connected autonomous vehicles that's where we send we will send that to a uh, a central uh, a co computer or a controller okay yeah. manufacturers are concerned primarily with safety as autonomous cars are likely to have passengers how can the f110 work get translated to current industry and manufacturer safety concerns yeah so so let me give you an example there is uh, the dot karma a program that is uh, you know uh, 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 that's a federal highway uh, safety uh, administration's uh, 
main focus on connected uh, driving automation. Uh, they have over six, uh, uh, 12 uh, autonomous uh, vehicles, that's four autonomous trucks and eight autonomous cars. And when they want to go and test out, you know, a new way of working with autonomous vehicles, a new algorithm, they first want to implement that in the 110 scale and evaluate that. And then they want to and, and, and make sure that the engineers understand what they're doing and stress test it at 110 scale. And then they go ahead and, and scale that up to the full scale rather than going directly to the, the full scale vehicle and doing that, right? So, so they are uh, promoting uh, simulation, 110 scale, full scale kind of pipeline of developing uh, the safety strategy. I have a whole other presentation on how do you build safe autonomous vehicles uh, and all the research and all the aspects that we do. This paper, for example, is one kind of technique of you know, how, how do you balance you know, safety and performance? And so when you're driving, you want to, you know, as an autonomous vehicle, you're really looking at you know, the other vehicles around you and you're trying to figure out what is that vehicle's driving policy? Is that a cooperative driver? Is that an aggressive driver? And it's going to be a mix of all of this. So, so this is in a very few snapshots, it is understanding how that other vehicle is going to drive. And then it is coming up with a control strategy and a confidence level of how aggressively it can overtake that vehicle. So by focusing on racing, we are still focusing on the safety problems, but we are focusing on, on it in the adversarial limit of that problem over here. And uh, so is this going to be directly, you know, uh, put into uh, General Motors or Ford's autonomous vehicles? No, but the learning that we have over here will definitely help you know, uh, in, in designing a safer system as we go forward. Safety with autonomous vehicles is an extremely complex problem. And uh, over here, you know, it's also about how other drivers interact. If I make a move, the other driver makes a move. In Philly, other drivers are quite insane because if you try to, if, if, they're, if you try to merge, they will just come and jam in front of you, extremely aggressive and, and impolite. But then, then you know that, and over the years I've decided, okay, well, with kids in the back seat, I'm an extremely passive driver, and I, I just, I don't have to race anybody because we are all going to meet each other at the next red light. So, but in this case, you know, really we are taking, we are getting very quick understanding of how the other drivers are going to move. Are they, how are, are they changing lanes? Are they swerving? And these are a lot of machine learning algorithms that are behind, which was these systems are too difficult to model in a first principles manner like that. And we show that with the real vehicles too. And so that was a paper in, uh, in this conference called ICML for uh, machine learning. And uh, it was very well received last year. This is a paper on, you know, how do you do super optimization for autonomous racing? It's really saying that, well, if I have, you know, this racetrack and I have, and what is the best car that I can build? And what are the best software stack that I can use to win this race? If I have a different track now, what's the best car I can build? And what's the best tuning of my software track that I can have? And so on, right? So how do we have an automated way of saying that I can optimize the mechanical parameters of my vehicle in terms of, you know, the cornering stiffness, the surface friction coefficient, and I can... To, to select the best path of, you know, to drive along that, that track and for the best path to find the optimal speeds. And this is a very complex convex optimization problem. And then to figure out what are the best parameters for my, you know, perception and planning and control uh, uh, pack, uh, stack so that I can actually ra race the fastest over here. And so we, this is an automated tool chain that is really taking in the track and design and, and identifying what are these parameters for the vehicle, for the track, for the speed, for perception planning control stack, which are all in very different domains of optimization, but making that into a, a super optimization pipeline and then being able to op come up with an answer and saying, okay, well, this is, the, this is what you should select for the vehicle and for each of these parameters. And now you have basically the, 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 the fastest, and the best vehicle that you can have to, to race this track. And like I showed you before, this works for real as we uh, drive over here. So, uh, so this is really saying, you know, how can we remove, you know, a lot of the manual tuning uh, that is done 
and actually do this with a click of a button. So, and our goal is really to make things, you know, push button and frictionless so that you get the highest performance vehicle. And now you give me a new track, I'll give you the, the, the best and fastest beast that can win on that racing track like that, right? So uh, is it fair or unfair? I'll leave that as an open debate. Now, where is F110 going forward? This year, we are a premier, we've formed many partnerships where we are a premier member of the AutoWare Foundation and we have uh, folks working full time on F, you know, running the AutoWare software on the full scale vehicle and also on this 110 scale vehicle. So we actually have can start to relate the similitude and planning and control for racing, for, for cargo driving scenarios and so on. We are also part of the, you know, the Eclipse Foundation where we now use a lot of the software frameworks that are, you know, industry accepted. And so by working within this ecosystem, we actually, you know, have a vital function in providing, you know, extremely good use cases, platforms, and many companies are starting to use this as a training approach to upgrade their employees, you know, who have not had a background in machine learning or robotics, but to be able to get that very quickly. Uh, I also mentioned the DOT Karma folks, uh, they, they, this is their slide actually, uh, and uh, where they have full scale autonomous vehicles, but they use the 110 scale as a rapid prototyping tool uh, and also as a testing tool over here for, because they want to have fleets of these vehicles communicate with each other and do collaborative perception, collaborative planning, collaborative control, but you can't do that uh, without, uh, you know, a risk over here and, and without a lot of, you know, complication in setting up that test. So this is the last slide. Uh, <laughs> the whole point is, you know, how do you actually become not just a, a very good engineer, but also how do you actually become a really good autonomous, you know, a systems uh, designer, right? And how do you start to think about that as a first generation, you know, autonomous systems engineer? So thank you for your time. Uh, all of the information I've provided here is available on f110.org. We teach you how to build, how to code, how to race, and you can see all the events. Uh, we will have a uh, and the next event will be part of the IROS Robotics Conference uh, in Prague, and that will also uh, coincide with the F110 European Union Grand Prix uh, later this year. Uh, I have another question for you. Sure. Can smart sensors mounted on infrastructure provide ground truth information of value to AV race vehicles, or does your vision of the future reveal all sensing and computation to be on board? That's a fantastic question because uh, a lot of our projects right now, uh, you know, are balancing between the first person ego, the ego view of the vehicle and the vehicle making all its decisions independently versus having infrastructure mounted LIDARs, cameras and interconnected systems to then orchestrate the movements of, you know, one or more vehicles within that. And so that is, that is 2021's, you know, shift in how F110's, uh, the R&D team at Penn is working on uh, F110 as a whole, where we are complementing the edge-based, you know, machine learning that is on board in the ego vehicles. We call it ego vehicles, which is the, the, the actual vehicle uh, and the infrastructure. So rather than just having all of the cost within an autonomous, you know, vehicle, we can have a much cheaper, simpler vehicle and move the cost to autonomous infrastructure. And a lot of LIDAR companies, a lot of camera companies are moving within that direction too. Uh, and whether that's in factory floors and manufacturing facilities, um, but uh, that's what we, are, we have. So this semester, even though I'm on sabbatical, my team has over 18 master students from robotics who are working on you know a different projects and and, uh, and and this is this is one of the themes that we have it's a great question yes thank you so much dr rahul mangaram for sharing your work and to all of today's attendees thank you for joining us as I mentioned earlier, today's presentation will be posted on the Mobility 21 What's Happening page of the website. 
along with a link to the video of the session. This afternoon, you will be receiving an email asking you to take a short survey about today's SMC. Please take a few minutes to provide your feedback. For students who are interested in engaging in transportation topics, the Transportation Club on campus is a great way to plug into transportation topics with fellow transport nerds. Our first meeting is next Monday from 12 to 1 EST. Our next SMC will be with Maxine Eskenazi on the 19th. Please watch for your invitation to join us closer to that date. Again, thanks for attending today and please feel free to contact us with any questions. Thank you.